Part One of A Dialogue Between a Methodist and a Church Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dialogue Between a Methodist and a Church Man by William Law. The Methodist read by David Barnes. The Church Man read by Kirsten Ferreri. Part One. Say what you will, sir, I must still stand to it, that almost all the sermons of your bishops and curates for these last hundred years have been full of soul-destroying doctrine. Pray, what is that doctrine? It is the doctrine of salvation partly by faith and partly by works, or justification by faith and works. Salvation by faith and works is a plain and very intelligible scripture truth. But salvation partly by faith and partly by works is a false and groundless explication of the matter, proceeding either from art or ignorance. What sounder gospel truth than to say that we are saved by Jesus Christ, God and man? But what falser account could be given of it than to say that, if so, then we are saved partly by Jesus and partly by Christ, that Jesus does something and Christ adds the rest? For is not Jesus Christ as such the one undivided Saviour, with one undivided operation? And who can more endeavour to lose the meaning, and pervert the sense of this gospel truth, than he who considers Jesus as separately, and Christ as separately, doing their parts one after the other, the one making up what was wanting in the other towards the work of our salvation? Now, to separate faith from works in this matter, the one partly doing this and the other partly doing that, is in as full contrariety to Scripture, to all truth and the nature of the thing, as to separate Jesus from Christ. For as the one Saviour is manifested in and by Jesus Christ, one undivided person, so one salvation is manifested when faith is in work, and works are in faith, as Jesus is in Christ, and Christ is in Jesus. Again, how plain and good a scripture truth is this, that the loving of God with all the powers of the heart, soul, and spirit, and the loving our neighbor as ourselves, is the one true fulfilling of the whole law and prophets. But how falsely would this be set forth by him who should say that it is partly the love of God, and partly the love of our neighbor, the one adding that which the other wanted, and doing that which the other could not do, as if they were two separate things, which with their different powers make up the fulfilling of the law. For these two loves, or rather the two names of love, are in the strictest truth but one thing, one divine spirit of love, from one ground, full of one and the same operation, no more different or separable from one another than flame is different or separable from its flying upwards. Thus St. John, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. But he could not therefore be a liar, if the love of God was a different or separate thing from the love of our neighbor. Yet this is your friend's false and mistaken way of setting forth justification, if so it be. It is by faith and works, namely, his dividing them asunder from one another, and ascribing his own invented partlies and partlies, first to one and then to the other, all which is as mere fiction and full of the same absurdity as if some other scholar should with the like partlies set forth the state of a living creature, that is, if it is in a living state, it must be so, partly by life and partly by its living operations, as if life and its living operation were two distinct and separate things, that contributed their separate powers, and joined in their different actions to make and keep up a living creature. This, and not one jot less, is the absurdity of your partlies and partlies, ascribed to a justification supposed to be the effect of faith and works. For Christian faith and Christian works are as much one and the same indivisible thing as life is one and the same indivisible thing with its living operations. I can call all this nothing else but quibbling about words, and mere running away from the one only thing which ought to be debated, and that is, whether St. Paul hath not, over and over, placed the whole of justification in and by faith alone. Let me ask you, did you ever hear or read of a dead faith and a living faith? Or do you think the difference between them to be nothing at all, but that the one has as much of justification in it as the other? This is a trifling question, since you know as well as I do, that our awakened preacher has expressly declared that there is dead faith, 
and that it is then dead when it worketh not by love. Well then, if so, the matter stands thus. Works prove faith to be living. Want of works prove faith to be dead. And thence you conclude that it is a soul-destroying doctrine to teach Christians that they are to be saved by faith and works. Surely, sir, you are not quite awake. You are growing hot, my friend, but be as hot as you will. I must tell you in the words of Mr. B., that be you ever so sober, serious, just, and devout, you are still under the curse of God, provided you have any allowed reliance on your own good works, and think that they are to do something for you, and Christ to do the rest. In answer to this I only say that be you and your friend ever so full of faith, so that you could remove mountains, you are still under the curse of God, provided you have any allowed reliance on your own faith, and think that it is to do something for you, and Christ to do the rest. For a reliance upon our own faith, and a reliance upon our own works, are just that same good thing, and equally contrary to the truth of faith and the truth of works. What true Methodist ever called true faith our own faith? Does not the Scripture say it is the gift of God? What true Christian ever called good works our own works? Does not Scripture say it is God who worketh in us both to will and to do? Now, if your faith may be called good and saving because it is God's gift and power within you, then a Christian's works may be called good and saving, or such as work out his salvation, because they are all wrought in God, and by his power working in him. But now, suppose one man to rely on his faith, and another to rely upon his works. Then they are both of them carnally minded, and the faith of the one and the works of the other are equally the same worthless filthy rags. On the other hand, do but as plain scripture requires you, ascribe good works of the same original and divine power as a right faith must be ascribed to, and then faith and works are equally one power of God to salvation, because equally the same saving, redeeming, and sanctifying work of God in our souls. I wonder you should thus strive to puzzle and darken one of the greatest and most plain truths of the gospel. Can anything be more plain than the case of the Pharisee? God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, etc. Here you have works pleading their cause. Now how came the publican without any works, saying only, God be merciful to me, a sinner, to be justified rather than this good working Pharisee? Can anything be more decisive than this? Let it then be supposed that the Pharisee had said, God, I thank thee that my faith is not like other men's faith. It needs not the help of fasting and praying, etc. I ask you, had this been a better Pharisee than the other? Had this boasting of faith been better than that boasting of works? Or might not Christ have justly said that the publican's God be merciful to me a sinner had more of God and goodness in it than the Pharisee's boasting of his solitary faith? But now, if such a passage as this, of a Pharisee boasting of a faith without works, was to be found in Scripture, and condemned by Christ, surely it would be great delusion to appeal to it as a full and decisive proof of the vanity and insignificancy of faith, and of its being rejected by Christ as of no avail. Yet this would be full as well, as to appeal to what Christ said of the Pharisees' boasted works, as a full proof that works are rejected by Christ as worse than nothing. Say what you will, I am fully assured of this great truth, thus expressed by our friend, that the moment a man seeks to be justified by his own obedience to God's laws, that moment he falls from Christ, and ceases to have an interest in him. Here just the same answer as before will be sufficient, that is, that the moment a man seeks to be saved or justified by his own faith in God, that moment he falls from Christ, and ceases to have an interest in him. This is just as good an argument against faith itself as your friend's is against works. For own faith and own obedience are at the same distance from God, and are as mere works of the flesh, as self-seeking and self-love. But if your friend would have spoken to the purpose of the matter in hand, he should have expressed himself thus, that is, that the moment a man seeks to be justified or made acceptable to God by works wrought by the Spirit of Christ living in him, that moment he falls from Christ and ceases to have an interest in him. Had he thus expressed himself, you see what an absurdity there had been in it, 
and yet, without thus expressing himself, his words are quite foreign to the matter, and touch not these works which are affirmed to be essential to a justifying faith. For the true Christian man never thinks or talks of being justified by any own obedience, any more than a being washed and saved by his own precious blood. But though he has no own obedience, no own works, any more than he has an own will and own love, yet he has an obedience and works and will and love that reach heaven and unite with God. How so? It is because by the supernatural word and spirit of God come to a fullness of birth in him, his obedience, his works, his will, his love, are that which they are, and do that which they do on earth, to the glory and by the same spirit of God, as angels do in heaven. This is the new creature that is justified by faith and works. Suppose faith to be not from Christ, or works not from Christ, and then they are both of them but works of the flesh. But add Christ to faith, and Christ to works, and then they are but one and the same power of God to salvation, and all difference between faith and works is lost, and nothing remaineth but Christ in us, the hope of glory. But your friend forgetting or not knowing that no works are called salvation works, or pleaded for as such, but those that Christ worketh in us, considers and confounds all works as own works, and selfish works, and so condemns Christian works and the necessity of them, upon no other ground but because own works, which proceed from self, are false, vain, and unprofitable to our salvation, whereas our blessed Lord has in the plainest manner distinguished them from one another, and shown us when and how works are good and godly, and works of salvation, justification, and sanctification. When thou dost thine alms, saith he, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets, to be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Here you see what an own work is, and why it has no salvation goodness in it. It is because it is done only to trumpet forth its own glory. Now, where anything like this trumpet goes along, either with that which we call faith, or works, though it should have ever so heavenly an appearance, it has only the nature, and can have only the reward, of vainglorious alms. God said to a holy prophet of old, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Here is one kind of religious trumpet. The Pharisees were learned men, and full of religious zeal and they had also their religious trumpet, which our Lord condemned. Therefore zeal and trumpeting are not good, and things to be trusted to, because they pretend religion, but may be as different from one another as a Pharisee is from a holy prophet. This ought to be well considered by all who set a trumpet to their mouths in God's cause. For if all that was alive in the trumpeting prophet be not alive in them, they will begin too soon and run before they are sent by God to preach of the true life and the true death to a world ignorant and careless about them. Again our Lord saith, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen of men. Very I say unto you, they have their reward, and can have no better reward, because he that thus prays makes prayers an own work of own glory, and therefore they are but an abomination before God. But now, will you from hence tell the world that alms and prayers are soul-destroying things, or at best mere filthy rags that signify nothing to him that uses them, because such alms and prayers are said to be so by Christ? For has not Christ in this very place taught you the direct contrary, and said as much of the salvation power of good works, as he has said of the nothingness of pharisaical works? When thou dost thine alms, saith he, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doth. And again, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Why is all this secrecy? It is that the whole work may be solely from and to and for God, and that self may have neither beginning nor end nor the least share of it. Now I ask, have these alms and these prayers nothing of salvation goodness in them, when our Lord therefore commands them that we may thereby obtain a reward in heaven? Can they help us to a reward in heaven without helping forward our salvation? 
If a heavenly reward follows such works as these, must they not, on the same ground, in the strictest sense of the words, be called saving alms, saving prayers, as any faith, from Adam to Abraham to this day, can be called saving faith? What are all the promises made to the faith of the fathers, of a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God? What is that better and heavenly country, which was to be the reward of their faith, but these very rewards here promised by Christ to be the works of Christian alms and Christian prayers? Our blessed Lord's whole divine Sermon on the Mount is nothing else but a continual doctrine of good works, and a continual doctrine of such rewards as belong to the faithful, diligent workers. No blessedness is ascribed to a single faith, but all along to some one or other godly work. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Do good to them that hate you, give to him that asketh you. But why all this? It is that you may be children of your Father, which is in heaven. Surely, then, such works as make us to be children of our Father, which is in heaven, may said to be saving works. Well, now I fully believe what a very great man has often said, that you have not one right thought or notion about justification. But however for once I must desire you to say what and when and where justification is. Surely I shall not be much mistaken if I shall venture to say, it is then and there where is no condemnation. Now St. Paul saith, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you ask him, Who are those that are in Christ Jesus? He tells you, in the very next words, they are those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. But no one doth, or can walk after the flesh, but he who doth the works of the flesh. Nor any one walk after the Spirit, but he who doth the works of the Spirit. So then, whether you consider justification or condemnation, works are the whole of the matter. No condemnation but from our evil works. No justification but from our good works. Evil works are from the spirit of Satan, working and ruling in our animal birth of Adam's poisoned flesh and blood. Good works are from the spirit of Christ, working in that blessed seed of the woman, or incorruptible seed of the word, common to all men, till it comes to a birth of the new creature, created unto good works in Christ Jesus. Thus the works of the devil in us are our only condemnation, and the works of Christ in us are our only justification and by thy works thou shalt be justified, is just the same scriptural immutable truth as by thy works thou shalt be condemned. Would you see the truth of justification, and the truth of condemnation free from all possibility of mistake? Look how the righteous judge of all the world will proceed at the last day. Mankind is then to be divided into two sorts of people, the one called sheep, the other goats. To the sheep saith Christ, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Whence now comes this blessedness? Or how came they to be the blessed heirs of such a prepared kingdom? The one sole reason of it is thus given by Christ, namely because of their good works. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat, naked, and ye clothed me, sick and in prison, and ye visited me. Here you have the last full and final justification, ascribed to nothing else but works done in and by and for Christ. Is there here any room left for you or any Christian to ask one single question, or have the least doubtful thought about justification, what it is and how it comes to pass? Can you be taught by a higher authority or in plainer words that works, Christian works, are all the justification that will stand you instead at the last day? Again, to the goats, saith Christ, Go, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Whence now have these goats their cursed state, that cast them into the hell of the devil? The one sole reason given by Christ is because they had not done those works by which his sheep were justified and blessed, and made to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Here you have the last, full, and final condemnation ascribed to no one thing else but the want of works. And who is it that teaches you, but he who is the truth itself, and the father of all truth, both in men and angels? What occasion, then, for so many labored critical volumes about faith and works in order to justification? If you hold more or less or anything else about justification than that which Christ has here asserted, the spirit of Antichrist must have helped you to it. For call anything a justifying faith but good works, and then you have your doctrine as surely from Antichrist as if you were to hold that they were the blessed sheep whom Christ called goats and cursed. 
Christ is the one great infallible teacher about justification, and what he has said in two or three words about it can no more have anything taken from it, or added to it, or altered in it, than his last sentence on his judgment seat. Deceive not yourself, my friend, with a faith that hath not all its goodness, its truth, and perfection from works. For what greater deception can you fall under than to believe that anything can be your justification or your condemnation whilst you are in the body, but that which will be your justification or condemnation after you are risen from the dead? Now, after this determination of Christ, that nothing but works will pass for justification at the last day, look at the determination made by your friend, saying in the fullest contradiction of Christ that justification by faith and works is a most pernicious, papistical, and damnable doctrine, which doctrine, says he, I am verily assured no one can hold and be in a state of salvation. Is not every word here in full condemnation of Christ's doctrine of his sheep and their salvation through works as a most pernicious and damnable doctrine, tending to the destruction of all those who believe it and walk according to it? For does he who preaches salvation by faith and works teach anything else but that very doctrine which Christ taught, when he said, Come ye blessed because of the works which ye have done, and go ye cursed because wanting the works which ye should have done? Say no more, then, that papists and popish Protestants have invented this damnable doctrine of faith and works. Christ is the author of it, and he has sealed it with the same certainty as the day of judgment. Your friend's verily assured is quite as outrageous and frantic as if he had said, I am verily assured that damnation will be the state of all preachers and hearers who do not as fully exclude works from justification now as Christ will require them for justification hereafter. But pray, sir, if I am to give up my friend's doctrine, must I not give up St. Paul also, as a deceiver and false apostle? For so he must be, if justification is by works. What are his epistles to the Romans, the Galatians, and Ephesians, but so much pains taken to prove that we are saved or justified by faith alone? I am as much for all St. Paul's doctrine as for any other scripture and fully believe that he said nothing about faith but what he said by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But if you believe that St. Paul ever said one single word about faith, as it signifies a single act or operation of the mind, or that he ever distinguished or divided Christian faith from Christian works, you may be said to have read him with eyes that see not and ears that hear not. Surely your St. Paul and mine cannot be the same person, or you could never talk at this rate. I would ask you whether St. Peter taught a faith without works when he said to the Jews, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 11, and 12. Now, did it ever come into your head, from reading these words of St. Peter, that he there taught a salvation through Christ, that is, through the gospel religion, by faith without works? See also what Christ himself had said before of this very stone, and the builders that rejected it. Therefore saith he, I say unto you, the kingdom of God, that is, this very stone, shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 21.43 Now, would you, from these words of Christ, on which St. Peter's words are grounded, have ever thought of proving that the religion of the gospel, called by St. Peter the headstone of the corner, and by Christ the kingdom of God bringing forth its fruits, must be a religion of faith without works. What could be more extravagant than this, and yet not more so than to pretend to prove it from any words of St. Paul? For I defy any one to show that he hath ever said any more or other thing about faith alone, or meant anything else by it, as our salvation, but strictly and to a tittle, the same which St. Peter calls the stone, or that name alone by which salvation is to be had. St. Paul's faith alone is nothing else, means nothing else, but the gospel religion alone, and only attests that divine truth spoke from the beginning to the end of the New Testament, that the gospel dispensation, or religion, alone can be the salvation of men. When St. Paul speaks of works as quite unprofitable, nay hurtful to salvation, nothing is meant by them but Jewish and heathenish works, and by that faith which he opposes to them and sets up in the stead of them, he always means the whole system of gospel truths, 
the whole process of Christ, with all the salvation doctrines that belong to it. This is St. Paul's faith alone, by which we only can be saved, just the same thing as St. Peter's saying, there is no other name under heaven but this alone by which we can be saved. The only difference between Peter and Paul is this, that Peter, in his short expression, calls that the name alone by which we can be saved, which Paul, in his short expression, calls faith alone, and both of them mean the whole of that which Christ calls the kingdom of God, with its fruits thereof which kingdom of God is neither more nor less than the whole gospel system of Christ's process, with all the benefits and doctrines essential or belonging to it. Away, then, with your idle fancy of Paul's ever distinguishing Christian faith from Christian works, or ever giving the smallest preference of the one to the other. To the Jews who said to Christ, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Christ saith, This is the work of God, that ye believe in him whom he hath sent. This, St. Paul's sole and whole doctrine about faith alone, it is to believe in Christ. And that belief is the whole Christian work, the whole work that God requires, the whole salvation work. But why so? Because to believe in Christ is to embrace all and the whole of that which Christ was, did, suffered, taught, and commanded, as the one only salvation of men. End of part one Part two of Dialogue Between a Methodist and a Churchman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dialogue Between a Methodist and a Churchman by William Law. The Methodist read by David Barnes. The Churchman read by Kirsten Ferreri. Part two. I must confess you have said more than I expected to hear, and more than I can at present answer, but pray show me how it appears that St. Paul by his faith alone means nothing else but the Christian religion alone, or the system of gospel doctrines alone. You might as well ask me how it appears that Paul was an apostle or witness of Jesus Christ alone, for how could he be an apostle of Christ alone if he meant anything by his faith alone, but the whole that is meant by the whole gospel religion of Christ? Therefore, wherever St. Paul ascribes salvation to faith alone, you have the fullest proof that he himself could possibly give you, that by faith alone he means neither more nor less than the whole gospel religion alone. St. Paul has these words. God forbid that I should glory in anything save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here you see, all is rejected by the cross of Christ alone. This alone is his glory, and a good glory it was. But would not all that is true and good in this speech of Paul's be perverted and lost, unless by the cross alone you understand the whole process, doctrines, and precepts of a crucified Savior, that is, the whole Christian religion? Now, thus it is with faith alone. And if Paul had said, God forbid that I should glory in anything but in faith alone in Christ, he had said just the same thing as when he would have no glory but in the cross alone. For where all that is Christian joy or hope or comfort or salvation is ascribed to any one single thing, whether it be called faith alone or the cross alone, there that faith and that cross must stand equally, and only for the whole gospel religion. And then to say that a man is saved by the cross alone or by faith alone is the same sound, and good truth. I know whom I have believed, saith the apostle. And if he had said, I know whom I have followed, whom I had obeyed, the thing had been just the same. For to follow Christ, or to be in the faith of Christ, or to be a disciple of the cross, are three different expressions. But the meaning of them all is but one and the same. I am not ashamed, saith St. Paul, of the cross of Christ just the same as if he had said, I am not ashamed of the gospel kingdom of Christ. For that he means by the cross, the whole religion of the gospel. He tells you in saying that it is the power of God to salvation. And what is or can be this power but that whole process, precepts and doctrines of Christ which make the whole religion of the gospel? Again, I have determined, saith he, to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. But will you thence infer that all other knowledge, whether of the birth, life, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, was rejected by him as quite useless and unprofitable? Yet this would be full as well. 
as to infer that, because he saith, by faith alone ye are saved, therefore no works are to be admitted as saving, but are to be rejected as vain and quite unprofitable to salvation. For the knowledge of Christ crucified alone, and faith alone, are then each of them put for the whole gospel religion, and not for faith, as signifying a single power of the mind, nor for the cross, as meaning the single crucifixion of Christ. Further, Drop now for a while this consideration of faith, in which St. Paul has used it for the whole gospel doctrine, and consider faith in the sense in which our Lord and the whole Scripture most frequently speak of it, as a living, working power of the mind, that wills, and desires, and hopes, and trusts, and believes, and obeys. And in this sense of the word it will be absolutely true that works have just the same salvation in them that faith has because, in the very nature of the thing, works are of the same nature with, and inseparable from, faith, lest the faith or works be what they will, because faith is nothing else, has nothing else, but what its works are. This is equally true of every man, and every faith in the world. He has no works but the workings of his faith. For as life has no existence but in and by its living operations, so faith hath no existence but in its own workings. Now, if you will have a life alone without its living operations, then you must have a life that is without motion, without will or desire, without hearing, seeing, feeling, or any inclination to anything. And then you have a life that is just as good as a dead carcass. So, if you will have a Christian faith that is alone, and not made up of works, you must have a Christian faith that has no penitence, no humility, no denial of self, no hunger after righteousness, no striving to enter in at the straight gate, no love of God or your neighbor. For faith cannot be alone, or without works, till it is without all these workings. And then you have a faith alone, that is just as able to fight St. Paul's good fight of faith, as the dead carcasses to take a city. And let me tell you, that these works are not only the very essence of faith, and inseparable from it, but that faith itself can have no beginning, but from some one or other of them, nor any further growth, but as these grow more and more. For faith and its works beget, and are begotten of, one another. For as it must be said, that humility and penitence are the true fruits or works of faith, so it may be as truly said, that humility or penitence are the first root or seed from whence faith gets its birth. Faith, considered as an act or operation of the mind, is like any other faculty or power. It cannot be alone, any more than will, desire, longing, hoping, fearing, wishing, loving, trusting, or rejoicing, can any of them be alone, or in a state of separation from the rest. And to ascribe salvation to any one of these tempers alone, and by itself, would be as consistent with Scripture, and the nature of the thing, as to ascribe it to faith alone, considered as a single thing, and separate from all other works, or working of the mind. But faith not considered as the working of the will or an operation of the mind, but as meaning the whole system of gospel religion, may and must be alone salvation, without anything else but itself, and that for the same reason as St. Peter says, that Christ alone is the only stone, or the only name, by which we can be saved. Would you therefore come out of that thickness of darkness, which a blind Babylonish spirit of dispute has in these latter ages brought into St. Paul's doctrine of faith without works? This must be your way. You must take, or put faith for the whole gospel religion, when he opposes it to or separates it from works, and then you will rightly understand why he saith, By faith alone you are saved. You must also put Jewish or heathenish to the works, which he excludes from faith, and then you will rightly understand what works he declares to have no salvation in them. This is the true unerring key to all his whole doctrine about faith without works. But where has St. Paul himself told you that by faith alone he means the whole gospel religion alone? He has told it me as often, and wherever he has said that by faith alone we are saved. For how could he more show you that he means neither more nor less by it than by telling you that it alone is salvation? Would you have salvation to be obtained by something different from the whole of gospel religion? Fancy now St. Paul explaining himself and saying, When I ascribe salvation to faith alone, I do not mean by faith the whole of gospel doctrine. What greater absurdity could you charge upon him? 
This doctrine of faith alone and without works is nothing else but the gospel religion alone, in opposition to the religion and works of Jews and heathens, and is solely directed to these two sorts of people, and not, as is blindly imagined, to set Christian faith in opposition to Christian works, which would be no better than teaching a Christian to be good without goodness. To the Jews he thus speaks, we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Here faith and works stand for the two religions, the one of Christ, the other of Moses. For what are the works of the law but the works of the Mosaic religion, or what the faith of Christ but the whole new religion of the gospel? Therefore, to tell these people that they were to be saved by faith alone and without works was only telling them that they were to be saved by leaving or turning from Judaism to Christianity, or that they could not enter into the kingdom of God, or the gospel faith, or the church of Christ, for they all mean the same thing, till they had done with and left off all the works of the law. I testify, says he unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. To the heathens or Greeks he preaches the same doctrine with regard to their religious state, namely, that all the works of their religion and lives must be forsaken and turned from, that by embracing the religion or faith of Christ they might be saved. I have, says he, kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, publicly, and from house to house testifying both to Jew and Greek, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God signified the necessity of their having done with their former religion, works, and manner of life. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ signified the necessity of their becoming members of a new gospel church, or kingdom of Jesus Christ. Not a word through all St. Paul that rejects any works but those which Jews and heathens were satisfied with, and would not give up for the gospel state of the kingdom of God, which kingdom is called Paul the faith of Christ. Not a word of the sufficiency of faith alone, but where it stands for the whole of gospel doctrine. Again, St. Paul himself hath told me that by faith alone he means the gospel religion alone. In the following passages, I have, says he, fought the good fight, I have finished my course, and as a proof of this, he adds, I have kept the faith. Must not faith here stand for the whole gospel religion? Again, before faith came, we were under the law. Does not faith here as certainly signify the whole religion of the gospel, as the law signifies the whole religion of Moses? Again, if they who are under the law be heirs, then faith is made void. That is, the whole religion of Jesus Christ is made needless, and of no use or benefit. Can he more plainly tell you that by faith, as opposed to the works of the law, he means nothing else but the whole of the gospel doctrine? This is said to the Jews. To the Gentiles, at another time he speaks the same truth in these words, By grace ye are saved through faith in Christ, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, the very self-same gift, of which Christ spoke to the woman at Jacob's well, saying, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, what is this gift of God with his living water, but the Christ of God with all his redeeming process, from his birth to his ascension into heaven, freely given by God, that man might thereby be saved? Therefore this faith or gift of God by which alone we can be saved signifies neither more nor less than the whole gospel means of salvation. The apostle adds, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here works are totally excluded. But what works? Why only works of self, and works that man could or would boast of? But these works are only therefore excluded from gospel faith or salvation, that godly works, which have nothing of self or boasting in them, may come up in their stead. This the apostle affirmeth, saying, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained. Ephesians 2. How great, then, is that learned delusion which opposes Christian faith to Christian works, because Paul opposes it to the unchristian works of Jews and heathens, or because he will not allow their several works to have any salvation in them, therefore will have it that the true followers of Christ neither can nor ought to have any salvation from their doing the works which Christ has taught and commanded them to do. A believer, or hearer, without doing, is but one and the same self-deceived person. In the gospel we have a father bidding his son go to work in his vineyard. The son consents, and saith, I go, sir, but he went not. This consenting and doing is the perfection of a faith without works. Surely you never minded these words of St. Paul, To him that worketh not, 
but believeth on him who justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted unto him for righteousness. Surely you have been deaf to all that has been said, or you could never come now with such a text as this. For no more is said in it against working, or against any other works, but that very single thing which he saith in these words, that by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh justified in his sight. Now, if it be the apostles' repeated doctrine that the deeds or works of the law must of all necessity be forborne, or ceased from, must he not for that very reason say to him that worketh not, that is, to him that ceaseth from working, as the law or religion of Moses requires, and turns to the faith of Christ, called the kingdom of God, this faith becometh his righteousness? But how doth it become his righteousness? The Apostle tells you, It is through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, what is the redemption through Jesus Christ, but a redemption by and through all that which Christ, as God-man, was, did, suffered, obtained, taught, and commanded, that is, through and by the whole of the gospel religion? How is Christ our propitiation, or peace, but by that which he is and does in the inward change and renewal of our nature, in creating us again to good works, in bringing forth a new creature, not born of man, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God? What is faith in his blood, but the same thing as faith in his cross? And what is faith in either case, but a hearty willingness and full desire wholly to cease or turn away from all heathenish or Jewish works, and to embrace and give ourselves up to all that is meant, taught, and required by the gospel faith or kingdom of God? Would you know the whole of St. Paul's doctrine about faith and against works or working? You have it all summed up by himself in the following words. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What room, then, for one single word about what he means by not working? Faith stands here for the gospel religion, and the deeds of the law signify the religion of Moses. No wonder, therefore, that he saith, A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So sure, therefore, as you conclude either more or less, or other than St. Paul's own conclusion, so sure you may be that you abuse the apostle, falsify his doctrine, and sow your own tares among his wheat. Let me here ask you, in the elegant words of a last most amiable divine, must the efficacy of Christ's obedience be enforced by the accession of our works, maimed and worm-eaten things? There may, for aught I know, be elegance enough in these words, but truth and sense is quite wanting. For what have our good works to do with the efficacy of Christ's obedience, either as to the lessening or increasing of it? Or how has his obedience anything more added to it by our good works, than it has anything taken from it by the evil works of those who crucified him? What careful doer of good works ever said or thought after this manner? I strive to obey thy will, O God, that thereby Christ's obedience may be made more perfect than it was in him. I lift up my heart and eyes to heaven, that Christ sitting there at thy right hand may be more powerful than it is in itself. On the other hand, what a wise man of faith would he be who should abstain from prayer, etc., lest he should seem, by such worm-eaten petitions, to be adding something to Christ's all-sufficient intercession in heaven. Again, fancy another man of faith alone saying thus, I cannot have any care about denying myself, taking up my daily cross, and following thee. I cannot do these things as helping forward my salvation, because that would be no better than presuming to help thee to be a more full and sufficient Saviour than thou art in thyself, and without my works. Can anything be more absurd or irreligious than this? And yet all of it is manifestly contained in the elegant words of your friend. If we walk as Christ walked, and do the works of Christ, we shall on that account be rewarded with him. This is the same good doctrine as when the Apostle saith, If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Here you see our own sufferings are not only required, but made the ground of our reigning with our suffering Saviour. But what man, not intoxicated with the elegance of words, would call or look upon this as adding our maimed, worm-eaten sufferings to make the sufferings of Christ greater and more valuable than they are in themselves? As silly a thought as to say that our following of Christ is helping him to be the Son of God. Our blessed Lord keeps our eye continually upon good works, or things that we ourselves are to do. Strive, says he, to enter in at the straight gate 
Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He does not say all is already gained, received, found, and opened by what he has done and suffered. Now if this striving, asking, knocking, etc., were but maimed, worm-eaten things, surely it had been better to forbid than to command them. Or if he had said to his disciples that this striving and seeking were such maimed, worm-eaten things, surely he had said as much against them, and with the same intention of turning them from them, as when he bid them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and compared their goodness to whited sepulchres, full of stench, corruption, and dead men's bones. You vehemently accuse the clergy with acting contrary to the articles of the church, because preaching up justification along with works— but you quite forget that your making Christian works no better than maimed, worm-eaten things stands in full contrariety to many of the best prayers in our liturgy. Thus, how many collects are like this? Grant, O Lord, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things that be good, and by thy merciful guiding perform the same. Is this prayer in vain? Or, if God hears us, can no better works come from it than worm-eaten things? Agreeable to this prayer, St. Paul saith, I can do all things— through Christ that strengthenest me. The same may every one say as well as he, but according to your new light, these all things are but worm-eaten things. Again, what difference is there between the old man and his deeds which we are to put off, and the new man in Christ that is to be put on if he has no deeds, but what are maimed worm-eaten things? But hear now what Christ saith of the necessity, the excellency, and efficacy of Christian good works, in the following words, Whosoever heareth my sayings, and doeth them, is like a man who built a house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when floods arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Here you see the excellence, the power, and efficacy of Christian good works, compared by our Lord to the strength and firmness of a house built upon a rock, which floods and tempests cannot overthrow. How could he more fully show you that they are the beginning, the continual strength and support of the divine life, than by comparing them to a rock on which a house begins, and from which it hath all its power of standing against all floods and tempests? How could he better show you that this rock of good works, all proceeding from his power within us, is that very rock on which he builds a church, against which the gates of hell shall never prevail? On the other hand, Call anything salvation but Christian works, and then you have Christ's word for it that you are like the man that without a foundation built his house upon the sand, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and great was the fall of it. Here again what our Lord saith of Christian works. A good man, saith he, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. But how could this possibly be if Christian works could be no better than maimed, worm-eaten things? And here, by the by, let me desire you well to observe whence it is, that the good man bringeth forth good things, not as your orator tells you, because Christ's goodness or righteousness is outwardly imputed to him, and so made his. No, truth itself tells you the direct contrary, that it proceeds from the good treasure of his heart, and therefore is a goodness born within him. Now, whence has he this good treasure of his heart, and what is it? It is that treasure of a divine life or nature which Adam had at first, and to which he died, and which by the free grace and mercy of God was secured to him and all his posterity, as a seed of the woman, a preserved remains or power of his first divine nature. Christ in Adam was his first glory and perfection of life, Christ remaining in fallen Adam, as a preserved seed of his first divine nature, is the only ground and foundation of his being able to be made again in Christ a new creature. This divine seed of the woman is so much of Christ remaining in him, and thence it is that Christ alone hath power to be the mediator and redeemer of man, because that which it is to be raised from death into life in us is nothing else but the incorruptible seed of himself in us. This, sir, is that good treasure of the heart, out of which the good man bringeth forth good things, and is in itself nothing more or less than a seed of Adam's first divine life within us, preserved by God's never-ceasing love towards man, as his covenant of grace and redemption within us, which seed, as it comes through the mediation of Christ to a new power of life in us, causes all those different sensibilities, called humility, penitence, fear, prayer, faith, hope, and earnest seeking after God. 
Will you now ever say a word more about your fiction of an outwardly imputed goodness, when Christ has so expressly told you that its birth is from within, from the good treasure of the heart which is himself within us, as good fruit doth from a good tree, he saith, either make the tree good, and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt, and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. No, say your imputation, doctors, that need not be. Let some good hand only hang good fruit outwardly upon it, and then you will rightly know the tree by its fruits. And it will be more glorious to the tree to have a variety of good fruit outwardly imputed to it, or hung upon it, than to have good fruit from its own good root. Our present matter is not about the doctrine of imputation. If you will not stick closely to the point of faith alone, I must beg leave to depart. The doctrine of the outward imputation of Christ's righteousness, and the doctrine of faith alone, is but one and the very same individual point. For what is your faith alone but a faith in that imputed righteousness? The righteousness of Christ we must have, or he can be no saviour to us. This is granted on both sides. But you, for the great glory of God and the great good of man, are for having it only outwardly imputed to us, which is just such a glory to God, and would be such a good to a blind man, as if, instead of opening his eyes, only the good far-seeing eyes of an angel were outwardly imputed to him. On the other hand, we believe and contend for an inward birth of Christ's righteousness in us, because it was the birth of our first glorious Father, and because it is to the eternal glory of God, and the eternal good of man, that his inward sinful nature may be quite destroyed, by a birth of his original righteousness rising up in its stead, that so all that was lost in Adam may be found again in Christ. Can you possibly be told this in stronger terms than when Christ saith, Except a man be born again from above, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God? St. John beareth witness to this truth, saying, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The same as saying, Till a man is born of God, he continueth under the power of his sinful nature. But why does such a man not sin? The apostle tells you, Because his seed, that is, the seed of God, remaineth in him. Had St. John the least thought of a righteousness of Christ outwardly imputed, when he places all our freedom from sin and power over it, to a seed of God remaining in us? Or if he had ever heard of such a thought in other people, how could he more fully condemn it than in saying, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Here you see, all is deceit, be they notions, opinions, faiths, hopes, imputed righteousness, or whatever else you can name, all is deceit till a man, by doing righteousness, is righteous, even as he is righteous. Then it is that Christ's righteousness has become his righteousness, and this alone is the righteousness of Christ that is his full and only justification in the sight of God, and that for this one reason, because it is Christ himself, that is his divine and righteous nature, born within him which the apostle thus strongly asserts, if ye know that he is righteous. What follows from this knowledge? The apostle adds then, ye know that every one that doth righteousness is born of him, that is, hath a birth of his divine and righteous nature brought forth in him, and consequently he that is not born of him hath nothing of Christ's righteousness to be his salvation. I must say again that you ramble strangely about with multiplicity of words. Our doctrine is that works have no share in saving us, because, as our friend strongly expresses it, Christ will either be a whole saviour or none at all. Had your friend said, We can have no salvation but in Christ alone, he had said a good scripture truth. But this strange unscriptural language of Christ, who will either be a whole saviour or none at all, hath the same bad meaning in it, as if he were to say, Christ will do nothing for us unless we forbear to concur or do anything along with him. Now Christ saith, Follow me, take my yoke upon you. But if following of Christ, if taking his yoke upon us is necessary, then something that is to be done by ourselves is as necessary to our salvation as that which is done by Christ for us. And some works are as truly salvation works as any acts of faith are saving. Whoever denied that we are to follow Christ and take his yoke upon us? But will such works do us any good, or recommend us to God? I will give you no answer, but in the decisive words of our friend, if, 
says he, you think that you have any good service of your own to recommend you to God, you are certainly without any interest in Christ. Our own service is but like own will, and no more good can come from it than from the old natural man with his deeds. But our Saviour has assured us that there is a good man, who out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. Now, these are the good works that are pleaded for as absolutely necessary and essential to a true and saving faith. Say now, that if we think such good works recommend us to God, we are certainly without any interest in Christ, and then it were better that you should preach such doctrine to stocks and stones than to Christian ears. For who can receive it without giving up the most constant and repeated salvation doctrines of Scripture? What more frequent through all our Bible than passages of the same nature with this, to do good and to communicate forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased? Now, must a man who believes this, and thinks that such things recommend him to God, be therefore certainly without any interest in Christ? Here Christ himself thus calling out for good works, in all those who expect to have any interest in him. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Will such a caller upon the Lord, without good works, have his sufficient excuse by saying, Lord, I thought thou wouldst be my whole Saviour or none at all, and therefore I durst not think of recommending myself to God, by doing his will, lest I should thereby lose all interest in thee. End of Part 2「Part three of Dialogue between a Methodist and a Church Man This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dialogue between a Methodist and a Church Man by William Law. The Methodist read by David Barnes. The Church Man read by Kirsten Ferreri. Part three. If you do not like my friend's expression, take the same truth in other words of some most excellent divines. Thus says one, Nothing is required in order to our participation of Christ and his benefits. There is no clogging qualification, no worth to be possessed, no duty to be performed, in order to our full participation of Christ and all his riches for all which he gives this solid reason, because it is not a matter of bargain, nor the subject of sale, but a deed of gift, the gift of righteousness, and gifts, we all know, are not to be purchased, but received. As wild and extravagant words as ever met together, as may thus be fully shown, Christ said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life and that they may fully understand the true meaning of that. He said also, Straight is the gate, and narrow the way that leadeth to life. Now, what Christ here saith of the straight gate and narrow way is strictly so much said of himself, and how he is the Saviour of the world. For the way and gate could not lead to life if they met anything else but Christ himself. Now, Christ and his benefits, considered as the blessed straight gate and narrow way to life provided by God, is wholly and solely the free grace and gift of God. Here was no bargain or sale of anything. Nothing was done on man's part to obtain it, and that for this very good reason, because Christ was thus given by God before the foundation of the world, and again, before there was a man born of a woman. See, then, the miserable delusion of your doctors, who, from this scripture truth that God has freely and out of mere mercy to the fallen state of man provided, and given a blessed narrow way and straight gate to eternal life, Thence conclude that no pains or trouble of striving to get into this narrow way, and through this strait gate, need be taken, note well, because, without any pains of our own, he freely gave it to all mankind, though there could be no blessedness in the gift, but because blessed are they who, with all their powers, works, and endeavors of spirit, soul, and body, strive to walk in this narrow way, and pass through this strait gate. Is not all this as gross a delusion, and in as full contrariety to the nature of the thing, as to conclude that because God has freely prepared and given us a cup of salvation, therefore there is no need that we should drink it? Or think that our own drinking it need not be added to make his free cup of salvation a benefit to us? 
Now, gross as all this is, it is the strong foundation, absurdity, on which alone your great divines build all their rhetorical flourishes of a salvation that is wholly the gift of God, without any works of man belonging to it. For they have not a word to say against salvation works, but that works did not produce God's first free gift of a Saviour to us, and therefore works can no more belong to this free gift of a Saviour after he is given than they did before he was given to us, being too systematically blind to see that, as a straight gate and narrow way were only given to us, we might do that which we could not do before they were given, or as the cup of salvation is only given, that we may drink that which we could not drink before it was given. So Christ was only and solely given for the sake of salvation works, which we could not do, till in him and by him we became new creatures, created again unto good works. How easily may you now see the vanity of these, and such like flourishing words! The gift of the great eternal sovereign are intended not to recognize our imaginary worth, but to aggrandize our views of his mercy and grace. Just as full of scripture truth and good sense as to say that God's gift of five and ten talents are not given us with this intention that our good use of them may appear, and that God may have occasion to say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant, but to show us how great are the talents and riches of God. Or again, that God's gift of a straight gate and narrow way to life is not given us that our well striving in it may appear, but only that the greatness of God's goodness to us may be shown thereby. See again what the same writer says of the man who is in the truth of the gospel. He labors neither first nor last to acquire any requisite to justification. When Christ himself has told him, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Surely this is enough telling him that from first to last nothing but works have either justification or condemnation in them. See again what another of your excellent divines saith. Do not think by any preparatory works to make yourselves worthy of Christ. What is this saying but, Do not believe Christ when he is speaking of worthiness and unworthiness, when he says, He that taketh not his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Do not believe St. Paul when he exhorteth the Thessalonians to walk worthy of God who hath called them to his kingdom and glory. Again, have a care of these words of Christ. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For you may easily thereby be led to think that repentance works have some kind of worthy preparation in them to make you fit for the kingdom of God. And now let me tell you that two or three old heresies joined together would not more abuse and contradict the gospel than your three doctrines, one of faith without works, two of a righteousness of Christ only outwardly imputed to us, and three of absolute election and reprobation. These are the scandal and reproach of the Reformation, wherever they are found, and have nothing to support them but that implicit adherence and systematic obstinacy which keeps Romish scholars steady to a Trent creed. Gospel salvation is, on God's part, a covenant of free grace and mercy, and cannot possibly be anything else. On a man's part, it is wholly a covenant of works, and cannot possibly be anything else. For the sake of works, man was that which he was by his creation. For the sake of works, he is all that he is by his redemption. Works are the life of the creature, and he can have no life better or worse than his works. That which he does, that he is. This do and thou shalt live is the law of works, which was from the beginning, is now, and always will be the one law of life. And when you consider the Adamical, patriarchal, legal, prophetic, or gospel state of the church, doing is all. Nothing makes any change in this. Nay, it is not only the one law of all men on earth, but of all angels in heaven. And this as certainly as our best and highest prayer is this, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This do and thou shalt live was the only law of life given to Adam in paradise. Adam could not have been capable of this law, but because the divine nature, or a birth of Christ within him, was his first created state, no law of doing God's will could have been given to or received by any of his posterity, but because a seed of the first divine life, or Christ in man, was, by God's free grace and mercy, preserved and continued in Adam, and secured to all his posterity, as a redeeming seed of the woman, which through all ages of the church should continue bruising the head of the serpent, till this first seed of life became God incarnate, with all power in heaven and on earth, to restore original righteousness, and to raise again in fallen man that first birth of himself, which was in Adam before he fell. 
This was the one power that he gave them to become sons of God. Nothing more need be said against all your doctrine, but that it is direct Arminianism. Do you think, then, that no more need be said in defense of your doctrine than that it is true Calvinism? I have appealed to nothing for what I have asserted, but to the words of Christ and his apostles, and would no more consult a Calvin, an Arminius, or a Zinzendorf how I was to understand them, than I would pray to God to be led by their spirit instead of the spirit of Christ. Nor is the one a whit better or worse than the other. Christ said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And again, He that is of God heareth God's words. If therefore you want hearing ears, or are not of God, to consult a grammarian how you are to understand the words of Christ, is as sure a way as you can take to be content with spiritual deafness and blindness, and never to be taught of God so long as you live. If I have called the law of works the one law of life, it is because Christ hath said the same to the lawyer who asked him what he should do to inherit eternal life. Christ asked him what is written in the law. He answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, spirit, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. To which Christ saith, Thou hast answered right, it's do, and thou shalt live. Here you have just the same thing said of works as is said of faith. The just shall live by faith. Therefore you can have no fuller proof given you than faith and works mean but one and the same thing, whenever life is sometimes ascribed to one and sometimes to the other, and therefore faith and works can no more be two things than eternal life can be two things. Again, hear how St. Paul asserteth the law of works to be the one law of life. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, if you have your senses so exercised to discern between good and evil, as to think that the law of works asserted by Christ and his apostle to be the law of life, is fitter to be received or not received, just as a Calvin or an Arminius are with it or against it, where must you look for the people who have eyes and see not, ears and hear not? I am quite tired with disputing in this manner, but yet will add one thing, which you will not be so able to puzzle as you have the scripture, and which must be acknowledged to be decisive, at least with regard to our awakening preacher. He heard a voice, as he really thought, from heaven, saying unto him, Cease from thine own works. Whence soever the voice came, it spoke well, and might have been just as beneficial to him as if it had said, Cease from thine own wisdom, thine own faith, or thine own projects in religion. For these are not only alike, but the very same thing. But if he took an advice to cease from his own works, to be an advice to cease from works that were not his own, it is much to be feared he misunderstood his adviser. If the voice had said, Cease from thine own faith, would he have taken this to be a sufficient divine authority to call the Christian world to a religion of works without faith, and to have told them of the damnable doctrine of adding faith to works? Yet this would be full as well as to preach against good works as having no salvation, goodness in them, because he was bid to cease from his own works. If you knew a minister so full of experience from his own works as to be quite uneasy at their insignificancy for many years, both with regard to himself and his hearers, such a man might well be said to have his eye too much upon his own works, to mistake the nature of them, and to expect that from them which can only be done by quite another power. To such a man as this, how wholesome would the advice be, Cease from thine own works, and why so? Because thou canst neither be thine own saviour, nor the saviour of them that hear thee, by anything that can be called thine own works. If, therefore, your fruitless preacher, instead of making a division between faith and works, in order to preach with divine success, had said to himself and his hearers, We have hitherto lived and laboured in vain, because, as the prophet speaks, we have committed two evils. We have forsaken the fountain of living water, and hewed out to ourselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, when or how may we be said to have forsaken the fountain of living water? It is when we expect or seek for good in anything but that which God is and does by his own word, light, and spirit within us. Look after anything but this. Have any trust in or dependence upon anything else but this divine operation, and then be as full of religious zeal as you will. You have forsaken the fountain of living water. Collect, divide, distinguish, and new model all doctrines, notions, and opinions as nicely as ever you can. You are only making a new-fashioned, cracked cistern that can hold no living water in it. 
What is the reason that sin and wickedness overflow like a flood the whole Christian world? It is because popish and Protestant churches have been, age after age, wholly taken up in hewing out of the gospel rock their several opinion cisterns. The Pope has his infallibility, and therefore his cisterns can have no failure or crack in them. Protestants have a Luther, a Calvin, an Arminius, a Beza, a Socinus, a Zinzendorf, etc., and if their cisterns are free from cracks, it is because they have nouns and pronouns, verbs and adverbs, prepositions and conjunctions to cement and strengthen them. What infallibility does in Popish, that criticism does in Protestant countries, and so, sad truth, the one fountain of living water is everywhere forsaken, and quite out of date. What wonder, then, if Christianity is but an empty name, a vain battle of opinions, instead of the life and power of God, born, dwelling, and manifested in our fallen nature? And here let me tell you, that all you see or hear or read of the best notions, truths, or doctrines, whilst you place anything in them, as considered in themselves, are to you only broken cisterns that afford no water of life. Eugenius said one day how charmed he was at first with the doctrines of the spiritual life, and the glories of a new birth, but that now, after some years striving to be good by the knowledge of such things, he found himself to be but just where he was, before he knew anything of them. But did any one ever tell Eugenius that these doctrines were the fountain of living water, and that by drinking of them he would have eternal life? How good are these words of Christ! Unless a man be born again from above, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But how useless are they to him, who is not thereby turned to seek and expect it all from God! How good is it to know that abyss of death into which our father Adam has plunged us! But how unprofitable is this knowledge, unless it makes us all hunger and thirst after that essential operation of the divine nature in us, which lived in Adam before he fell! All scripture doctrines, whether of life or death, are nothing in themselves, nor have any power of godliness in them, but are only to show us again and again this great truth, that the departure from God, into whatever it be, is the death of deaths, and the cleaving wholly and solely to God is eternal life. Think of anything but God as the cause of goodness, or that his goodness can be your good, but by being born in you, as it was in Adam and holy angels. And then, though you have all the three Christian creeds, you have turned your Christian God into an outward idol. For a God not living and working within you all that is or can be called your good life is but an outward idol of a God. And be assured of this, that as is the birth and working life within you, so are you, and can neither here nor hereafter be anything else but that which is born within you. Righteousness imputed from without is but like such imputed wickedness. And you may as well frighten yourself with fearing that the devil's wickedness should be outwardly imputed to you, as to think of having any righteousness of Christ, but that which of him and by him is born in you. But to return to Eugenius, let it be supposed that, having found himself not sanctified by his former notions, that he had recourse to others quite contrary to them, as faith without works, Christ's righteousness, not as a new birth in us, but only outwardly imputed to us, the number of saved and damned to all eternity neither greater than less than God's absolute decrees had made it. Suppose him now so charmed with the sweet sound of these doctrines, to be under such a sense of their saving power, as to be forced to come forth as a preacher of eternal death and damnation to all that would not seek to be saved by them. Could Eugenius possibly give further proof that he had forgotten and forsaken the one fountain of living water, and was calling the Christian world to a rotten cistern instead of it. This kind of reasoning comes too late. God has already set his seal to the truth and goodness of our friend's preaching. Thousands from far and near flock about him. Sighs, groans, swoonings, screamings of young and old proclaim the two-edged sword that is in his mouth. If you will not allow this to be proof enough, it is in vain to talk any further with you. All of this is so far from being proof enough of the truth and goodness of his doctrine that it is not proof at all. If it will do for him, it will do for Mohammed, and every successful deceiver. Zinzendorf has plenty of this proof. Not only these kingdoms, but great parts of Europe and America bear witness to it. And yet of these Moravians, carrying conviction wherever they go, and gaining such awakened converts out of every part of the Reformation, 
as are ready to sell lands and houses and lay the price at the feet of these your friend says he bears a preaching testimony against their corrupt principles and practices and might as well be called a murderer as a moravian what becomes now of your success as being god's seal set to the truth of your doctrine if rome was allowed to send her preaching missionaries amongst us to attack with full liberty of speech every protestant form of religion to travel from place to place daily telling all the men and women they could get together on hills and churchyards or elsewhere that dreadful soul-destroying doctrines had been constantly preached to them ever since the reformation that they had lost interest in christ since they left the pope that church and sects however setting themselves above one another were all equally in a certain state of damnation and must be so till they had true priests and true sacraments nowhere to be had but in the one ancient infallible mother church of rome if i should say that damnation thus thundered out to awaken people from their reformation dream of safety would soon have converts ten times more numerous and much greater crowds of various followers than you have yet to boat of who could have any show of reason to deny it poor man can you not see the miserable and wretched state of christendom that heathen wickedness reigns everywhere, that nothing of Christianity is left amongst us but an outward profession, destitute of any goodness but that of words and doctrines. How then ought you to rejoice that the mercy of God has here and there raised up awakened preachers to shake the hardened hearts of such apostate Christians? Who that has any spark of goodness in him would endeavour to stop their course? Whoever would, I am sure I would not. I wish from my heart that not only every parish but every house had such a divine preacher in it. Nay, though some should preach Christ out of envy and others through strife, yet I would rejoice if such contentious preachers did but preach the truth as it is in Jesus. But now supposing, as is but too true, that we have only the words and doctrines but not the spirit of Christianity, they are in the state of those that never had it and must be called to that same change in life as they were before they can be Christians in spirit and truth. The gospel thus began, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom was God's free gift. His own love was the sole cause of it, but it was only given to repentance because nothing else could possibly receive it. This repent, in order to the kingdom of God, was the only preaching which Christ set on foot, and sent into every city and village, but what do your preachers now say? Do they call the present unchristian world, as Christ ordered the unchristian world to be called to the kingdom of God? Do they say to Christians become workers of iniquity, that have long resisted God's Holy Spirit, long abused all gospel blessings, trampled all its pearls under their feet, and ever since their baptism been wallowing in the mire of their sensual lusts? Do they cry aloud to these miserable sinners, Repent and bring forth works meet for repentance, or it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah at the day of judgment than for you? So far from this, that they teach and affirm with vehemence to all these sinners, that no repentance, no qualification, no requisite, no preparation is necessary to put them in full possession of Christ and all his riches, and all for this absurd reason, because righteousness, that is, the means of righteousness, is the free gift of God, and was not procured or obtained by any works of men. Therefore salvation can require no works of men. Who can be blinder than he who sees not the difference between a Saviour prepared and given, and that salvation which is to be from him? Or who can more confound the most distinct things than he who affirms that of salvation, which is only true of the Saviour alone, it is true of the Saviour to say that he is freely given of God to be the Saviour of all men, but it is not true to say of salvation that it is freely given to all men. The works of man do no more towards making Christ to be the all-sufficient Saviour of the world than towards making him to be God and man. But to have salvation from this free given perfect Saviour, all is requisite, all is to be worked, laboured, and done, which he commands us to have, and do, and be. Therefore saith St. Paul of this perfect Saviour, that he is the author of salvation to all that obey him. Here you see what an error it is to speak of Saviour and salvation as one and the same thing, equally free and independent on man's works. The perfect all-sufficient Saviour is the free gift of God, that all men might be saved. But salvation is no free gift, but stands in the utmost contrariety to it. It is to be purchased. A Saviour you cannot, you need not buy. 
He has already given you, without price and without money. But all the salvation that you can have must be bought of this Saviour. There is nothing gratis here. But what are you to give for it? All that you have from fallen Adam. All that the world, the flesh, and the devil have treasured up in you. Nay, houses, lands, fathers, mothers, brethren, etc., are all to be forsaken. They must all of them lose that place and power that they had in you, or you have no salvation, though you never wanted a free given Saviour. Think of coming to Christ without these requisites, these qualifications, these preparation works, and then you will be just as welcome as the prodigal son would have been, had he come to his heavenly father with his harlots in his arms, that he and they might have rings and the best robes put on them, without their giving or doing anything for them. What now is the parable of all that penitence of the prodigal, his renunciation of himself, his forsaking of his way of life, his sense of his great unworthiness to have his first sonship, his begging to be admitted to the labor and obedience of a hired servant, what is all this for but to tell every son of fallen Adam that he is this very prodigal, this keeper of harlots, living with and like swine in a strange country, till he thinks of going to Christ with all those qualifications, preparations, and changes of life and manners with which the prodigal son went to his father? May it not now be justly said with St. Paul, Who hath bewitched you, you foolish preachers, to come forth with zeal and vehemence against qualifications, preparations, and requisites, to fit us for the grace and favor of Christ? Did the Heavenly Father send the ring and the best robe to his wicked son, whilst he was content with the harlots, his husks, and his swine? Was his eye of goodness turned toward him, till he saw him upon the road, a sorrowful seeker of his father, with penitential works and a full change of life? Now if Christ in his parable hath set forth a sinner come to his right senses, how can you more show that you have lost yours than by cautioning sinners against qualifications, penitential requisites, and preparations to be received by Christ? What is the whole gospel but one continual doctrine of all that is to be done, denied, renounced, and suffered, in order to have any interest in God's free gift of Christ as the Saviour of the world? Hear what the Saviour, who came to save all men, saith to those who forgot, that repentance and good works were the qualifications and requisites to have any share of salvation. I know ye not, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Is this a Saviour that calls for no salvation works, but will himself be our whole Saviour or none at all? Had Christ begun his gospel with saying, I am come to save you all without putting you to any pains or labor to be saved, I bring no terms with me, nor have any demands upon you. I look for no requisites, no preparatory, no repentance and self-denying works. I and all my riches are freely yours. Inward, inborn goodness cannot belong to you, but you shall be the children of God, not because you are led by the Spirit of God, but because my righteousness shall be outwardly imputed to you. Had this been the gospel of Christ, your preachers of no requisites, no qualifications to have interest in Christ, might well be received as faithful apostles. You all complain that Christianity is become a mere outward profession, without the inward spirit of the gospel. This just and true complaint, how vain is it in your mouths! For how can your Christianity, in its best state, be anything else but bare outward profession, if Christians neither have nor can have any righteousness but that which is outwardly imputed to them? Can you complain or accuse them of not being inwardly of the spirit and life of the gospel, if gospel goodness cannot be a birth within them but only the goodness of another, that is, to be accounted as theirs? Either therefore give up your outwardly imputed righteousness, or complain no more that Christians are mere formalists, for both you and all your preachers, however awakened, can only be formalists yourselves, and can awaken nothing but formality in others, unless the righteous spirit of Christ hath its fullness of a birth in the inmost spirit, both of preachers and of hearers. St. Paul saith, Circumcision is not that which is outward, but of the heart. Is it not as necessary to say of righteousness, that it cannot be an outwardly imputed thing, but must be the righteousness of the heart? Had Paul told them that the circumcision of the heart could only be outwardly imputed to the circumcisers of the flesh, he had preached the law as you do the gospel. Again, he is not a Jew, saith he, that is one outwardly. 
How unlike is this to your doctrine, which will not allow the Christian to be one inwardly, but solely by that which is outwardly imputed to him. Again, the Spirit, saith he, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But how could this be but because the Spirit that is within us is a birth of the Holy Spirit whose witness agreeth with it? For suppose, no birth of the Spirit within us, and then we have only that natural old man that knoweth not the things of the Spirit, because they are foolishness to him. Let me, before we part, only ask you these two questions. Would you be glad to see Christianity continued in its present poor, blind, and apostate state from the truth and life of the gospel? Or can you show me how it can return to its first purity and perfection of godliness, unless preachers go forth in such a spirit of zeal, calling the world to Christ as ours do? Take this for a full answer to every question of this kind. There are but two spirits that govern every rational and intelligent life. The one is the Spirit of God. The other is the Spirit that is fallen from God, and works contrary to Him. Nothing is good in any creature but because the good Spirit of God is the doer of it. Nothing is evil but that which is done by the Spirit of the creature fallen off from God, and working in self-will. Here you have the infallible touchstone for the trial of all spirits, which can never deceive you. Every spirit that calls you to be delivered from anything but the evil that is in your own spirit, or turns you to anything as a deliverance from it, but to the spirit and power of God within you, is not of God, but is an agent under that spirit that is fallen off from God. The Christian religion has no ground or foundation, but because the spirit of man has lost its first state of union with God, and is unable of itself to recover it. Hence it is that Christ, God and man united, is the one only possible restorer of man's first union with God. Therefore, the whole of our redemption consists in our being made one with Christ, essentially born of Him, that having His whole redeeming nature come to life in us, we may be in Him as He is in God, one spirit, one life, to all eternity. God was in Christ Jesus, saith Paul, reconciling the world to himself. But Christ was the reconciler between God and man, only and solely by that which he was, did, suffered, and obtained by and through his whole process. This is his mediation work. Are you in this process? You are in the arms of your mediator. His mediation work is like a new creation within you, and what God saw in his beloved Son, that he sees in you. And you must belong to God as He does, because His nature, life, and spirit are in you. Therefore, is any one reconciled to God? It is because Christ is born in Him. But the seed of Christ, which is in every son of Adam, never comes to the fullness of the birth of the new creature, but through the process of Christ. This is the one straight gate and narrow way, out of which there is nothing but sin, death, and hell to every man. Without Christ, we are without God. But who is without Christ is told you in the following words, Unless a man deny himself, take up his cross, etc., and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. This is the one term of union with Christ. Suppose now a preacher comes to you from Rome with his invented doctrines about saints, image, sacraments, transubstantiations, etc., threatening certain damnation to all that do not receive them. Suppose another coming from Geneva, as full of damnation for all those who will not receive his invented doctrines of saving faith without works, of the righteousness of Christ not inwardly born, but only outwardly imputed to you, of a salvation and damnation, equally the one sole work or gift of God, neither of which you can any more help or hinder than you can help or hinder the duration of the world, or add one cubit to your stature. What gospel eyes must he have who did not see as many marks of the beast, the whore, and the false prophet in one of these preachers as in the other? Or can you think, if St. Paul was again in the world, he would give a heartier God's speed to the one than to the other? Had the apostle been a preacher of your imputation doctrine, he never would have said, What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, as knowing that this was the very fellowship which Christ had with the sons of fallen Adam, his righteousness being only outwardly imputed to their unrighteousness. And how could he have cried out, as of an impossible thing, What communion hath light with darkness, or what concord hath Christ with Belial? 
for, had your imputation doctrine been his, he would have known that if light was but outwardly imputed to darkness, then the darkness would be in communion with light, and if Christ's righteousness was but outwardly imputed to the sons of Belial, then there would be concord between Christ and Belial. This is the blasphemous absurdity of your imputation doctrine. For unless the whole fallen nature of man be born again from above, the righteousness of Christ, outwardly imputed to it, is but like the same imputed to the unchanged sons of Belial. Without me, saith Christ, ye can do nothing. That is, all is in vain without my process, for Christ is that which his process is. St. Paul saith, No one can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Ghost. In these two short texts you have the whole nature and substance of Christian redemption, namely, that it all consists in the process of Christ, and the coming of the Holy Ghost. Christ's process in the flesh is the only way of dying to all that fleshly evil that Adam brought to life in us. Christ came in the Spirit, is the only one quickening of that divine life to which Adam died. Trust to anything else, seek to anything else but this process of Christ, and this power of the Holy Ghost, and then all your leaning upon the gospel will be no better than leaning on a broken reed. These two fundamental truths plainly show why the first preaching of the gospel began, and must ever go on, saying nothing but what is implied in these words, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand repent, shows the necessity of making Christ's process the one way to the kingdom of God, for repentance works are in his process, and nowhere else. For the kingdom of God is at hand, shows that Christ's coming in the Spirit is the one thing sought for by his process. For the kingdom of God come amongst men is nothing else but Christ come in the power of the Spirit. And where this power is not come in the likeness of a kingdom, wherever plenty there may be of preachers, the kingdom of God is yet afar off. The law ended with Christ come in the flesh. His process was the fulfilling of all its types, figures, and sacrifices. The coming of Christ in the Spirit is just the same one, only fulfilling of all the gospel dispensation. And as the law would have been all in vain without Christ's coming in the flesh, so would the gospel also without Christ's coming in the Spirit. And the Jew, with his Old Testament, rejecting Christ come in the flesh, is just as true to the law as the Christian is to the gospel, who does not own Christ as come in the Spirit, to be the only one fulfilling of all its doctrine. For as all the types, figures, and sacrifices of the law were in themselves but empty shadows, without Christ being the life of them, so all things written in the gospel are but dead letters, till Christ, coming in the Spirit, quickens a new creature to be the reader, the rememberer, and the doer of them. Therefore, where the Holy Spirit is not sought after, trusted to, and rested in, as the end, the substance, and living power of the whole gospel, it is no marvel that Christians, high or low, learned or unlearned, churchmen or dissenter, should have no more of gospel virtues than the Jews have of patriarchal holiness, or that the same lusts, vices, and worldly craft which prosper among apostate Jews should break forth with much strength in a fallen Christendom. See here, then, your work, ye awakened preachers. If God has sent you forth, you can have no other end but that on which Christ sent his apostles. Do you preach anything but the process of Christ as the way to the kingdom of God, or call men to any power of walking in it but that of the Holy Spirit? You are strangers to, or deserters from, the truth, as it is in Jesus, for neither Christ nor his apostles ever taught anything but this. The old man must die, or the new man can never be made alive in Christ. But nothing brings death upon the old man but that one self-denying process of Christ. Nothing gives life to the new man but the one Spirit of Christ born in it. This is the gospel language from the beginning to the end. With this language in your mouths, the whole gospel is with you. You may cry aloud and spare not. Be as zealous here as you will or can. Go out into the streets and lanes, the highways and hedges. Compel hypocrites, sensualists, worldlings, and hardened sinners to tremble at their ways, to dread everything that is contrary to Christ's salvation process. Preach certain damnation to every sinful lust of the flesh, and no possible power to be delivered from it, but by Christ coming in the Spirit, to set up his own kingdom of God within you. And then, everyone who has the least spark of goodness living in his soul, will call you sent of God, will wish prosperity to all your labors of love, and no one will be against you but he that is not with Christ." But if you come forth with the new-fangled, ungospel doctrines of a Calvin, a Zinzendorf, etc., be your zeal as great as it will, 
it only unites you with the brick-and-mortar builders of that anti-christian babel which the prince of the power of the air has set up in full opposition to that rock on which christ has built his one catholic universal salvation church and now my dear friend wishing you from the bottom of my heart all that blessing which christ bestowed upon his apostles when he said my peace i leave with you my peace i give unto you i bid you farewell End of A Dialogue Between a Methodist and a Churchman